Dave and this is Logan out once again on a walk in the countryside. Thanks for joining us. Now today we're in the very pretty little town of New Oldsford in Hampshire and today we're going to be following a, a walk that's in a book by Vicky Fletcher, Hampshire and the New Forest, A Dog Walker's Guide. It's going to be about four and a half miles or so, a circular route taking us north uh, through some beautiful countryside and heading towards Abbotston and back. We'll be having a little look in the town itself so do join us. It's a beautiful spring, well nearly summer now morning, the sun is beginning to come through, temperature today is going to be close to 22, 24 degrees, should be superb. Well we're going to start our walk right by the old station which is just behind me here so let's have a look at it and here it is and it's a uh, this is the Watercrest line which is a, a heritage railway run by the uh, Mid Hampshire Railway and it runs 10 miles from here to Alton there are four stations on the line and the name originates from the days when it was used to transport locally grown watercress to uh, London and uh, <laughs> Logan's seen a cat in the far distance <laughs> in the morning sun wandering along the platform there. Well the line originally opened in 1865 and was operated initially by the London and South Western Railway until 1884 when the Mid-Hants took over I believe and it basically connected the existing lines at Alton and Winchester. The line closed in 1973 so Initially, it did survive the beaching cuts in the 1960s. Preservation as a heritage railway line started in 1975, with the line reopened a couple of years later, and then finally uh, all the way to Alton in 1985. Well, the first thing I want to show you as we leave the uh, railway station is this wonderful public toilet. Well, actually, I want to show you this plaque that's on the wall. There we go. Secret information hidden in this toilet was collected periodically by Harry Horton. Uh, and in 1961, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison for his part in the Portland spy ring. Of course, uh, that was um, that was a very much a, a famous Soviet spy ring, if I remember. Uh. You don't get many toilets with plaques on them, do you? <laughs> well, before we start the walk in the countryside, as it were, we'll have a little look through the, the town itself, because it really is quite pretty. Um, and we're making our way through the, the churchyard, and I'll just pan round to show you the, uh, the church, the St John the Baptist Church. And there's been a church of some variety uh, on this site for oh, 1,200 years or so. And there was one recorded in the Doomsday Book, but it was largely rebuilt in 1898 in Norman Gothic perpendicular style. Oh, look at that fantastic weather vane at the very top. I say there's so much to see in the town that um, yeah, normally I go into more detail with churches, but we do need to kick on. Well, we're just going to make our way out of the churchyard. Oh, I see there's a nice information board here. Uh, Oldsford took its name um, in Saxon times from a ford on the river nearby where older trees grew. The, uh, the new distinguishes the town from Old Oldsford which is an ancient hamlet about a mile to the north. In 1689 the town suffered from the first of two devastating fires which virtually destroyed it the second fire was in 1736 and much of the present town was rebuilt then. Well, I'm now walking down Broad Street which for many people reckon it's one of the prettiest streets in the whole of Hampshire as a whopping great big lorry goes by. So let me turn around and show you what I'm looking at. So it's 
was once uh, the main road from London to Winchester and the town was a major staging post with, with many inns. In fact there's still a Thursday market here that can trace its roots back to 1214. There's also a large sheep market many years ago with stock driven along Old Drove Road from Dorset and Wiltshire. It, uh, it's quite pretty with the trees lining each side. Okay, there's one more thing I want to show you <laughs> in the town. There's so much to see. Now you can probably hear, I'll well, gently turn around. Isn't that lovely? Now this is the town mill. Actually it was a 13th century corn mill here, demolished in 1891 and replaced by a, a brick structure that's here today. Although it ceased as a mill in the 1960s, it's, it's now a, a residential building. If I pull to the side, you can see it up there. Well, we're now starting our riverside walk. And, oh, look at this. Isn't that lovely? Ladywell Cottage. We just passed another house called Old Tannery, which uh, has got something to do with the river here. And we're going to now follow the, the bank of the river all. It's um, not much a short river, but it, it, it's a tributary really of the river Itchin, which it joins further downstream. Well, I'll just come off the path that goes by the river for a, a second, just to show you this lovely little memorial garden that's uh, open to the public here. It was given to Sir Francis Linley in 1951. He owned a warehouse nearby. And I did read that he was known to the to the world as well. He was fishing with Neville Chamberlain on the afternoon that uh, Chamberlain returned from visiting Munich to obtain Hitler's signature. But you can still see the outline of uh, an old swimming pool that was once here. But um, a lovely setting, and of course you've got the. Well, this is just a stream that feeds into the um, the river just next to it. Isn't that lovely. Uh, now walking by alongside the river, isn't this absolutely wonderful? And this is very much your classic English chalk stream with a a shallow gravel bottom and fast flowing water, fed all year round by chalk springs. And so the river here rises at Bishop Sutton, about one kilometre east of the, the town, and flows west to join the, the River Itchin, which is a 28-mile river that starts at Cheriton and eventually flows out into Southampton Water. But, oh, look at this. <laughs> Isn't this fantastic? This is Fulling Mill, and uh, it dates back to the 13th century but it was derelict by the 19th century saved from demolition in 1951 and now a private residence fulling by the way is the process of removing oil from wool but oh look at that a lovely garden not much privacy I suppose but <laughs> oh it really is a a chocolate box scene, isn't it? It looks as though they're still doing some work on it now as well. And uh, there's the other side. And there uh, we've got the lovely sound of gushing water. And lovely and clear as well. And there's another little stream feeding into the river in the distance. Oh, this is this is what I call a riverside walk. Absolutely stunning, it really is. And in in the far distance, um, oh, we can see some. It looks like vine trees. I think we're going to be heading it in that direction quite soon. Oh. Well, 
now, sorry to disturb you. Logan's not too sure about ducks. Come on. Oh, this looks like Duck City along here. Seems a shame to have to disturb them as we're walking by. But Logan's being a, a good lad. Uh, still following this riverside track. We're actually um, shortly going to be joining the uh, Wayfarers Walk, which is a, a 71 mile long route from Walbury Hill in Berkshire to Emsworth in Hampshire. And it's the approximate ancient route that may have been used by drovers taking cattle for export. But I notice we've got a little recreation ground here. So this might be a good opportunity just to let Logan have a little bit of a, a run. Another little, little building. Now this is the eel house, which uh, you can see there are three channels with iron grill traps. And those were set up on dark moonless autumn nights when mature eels started their one and only lifetime journey to breed. But this little building was last used in uh, 1980 and uh, sadly in recent years apparently European eels well their population has decreased dramatically possibly by as much as 80 or 90 percent but this building is about 180 years old I believe but, uh, look at that I keep the thing that keeps jumping out at me is how clear this water is. It really is crystal clear. been continuing to go westwards following the watercress way and just come across this ah, field upon field of vines I think very much so in fact I see there's a well there is a sign here Pingleston Estate Louis Pomery now I think that's uh I remember reading somewhere that that was the first English sparkling wine from a champagne to hit the market but perfect place to grow them we're now heading northwest we've been following an old drover's track slightly uphill and uh, sounds like a sounds like a bird scarer going off just to my right here some uh, watercress beds although I was speaking to a lady who lives in the cottage here she was telling me that these haven't been used for some years in fact they do have a an unloved look about them don't they more nettles than anything else but uh, we will see some uh, some working watercress beds towards the end of the walk so I'll tell you a little bit more about the history and the connection with the town when we get there oh just stop for a breather we were going uphill 
beautiful view that I want to show you. It's also given us an opportunity to have a little bit of water. Logan's got his little dog bowl there. But how about this? Isn't that smashing? So this is looking north across the valley and down in the bottom there I think that's the remains again of the old disused watercress bed and then the trees in front that's called Dog Kennel Row I believe and then you can just make out the yellow oilseed rape in the distance what a beautiful view and I think we're just going to sit here for five or ten minutes and just soak this all in Whew, well we've made it at the top of a ridge and the sun really is glorious now so this is as far west as we're going to go and we're now going to start heading north continuing along the uh, wayfarers way and you can see behind me a signpost the three castles path and uh, this is actually a 60 mile long distance path from Winchester Great Hall in Hampshire to Windsor Castle in, in Berkshire and uh, it goes via Odium Castle. entering the tiny little hamlet of uh, Abbotstone. There's not much to it, just a few cottages and a farm, but I'll explain why shortly. Look at this beautiful little cottage by me on the left. Isn't that lovely? But, uh, oh, it is so, it is so glorious. And there's a, a swan over there. In fact, I, yeah, this is a little stream in front of me that um, will eventually meander its way down and um, join the River Itchen. Oh, look at the little babies. <laughs> well, I mentioned that Abbotstone was a, a very small place. And indeed, there's the farm in the distance. But if I turn around, if you look on an old Ordnance Survey map, then it shows this as being a site of a deserted medieval village. And sure enough, it was recorded in the Doomsday Book. There was a, a mill uh, that flourished here until the 14th century. But then the Black Death came in, what, 1348, 49. And there was also a bigger growth in Alsford and uh, trade and the trade route changed through the town there. It's difficult to see, perhaps better on a Google map. I can just about make out some boundaries, which I guess must be um, boundaries or, or stock boundaries for fields for the households. There was a church here and between 18 and 20 households. But in 1428, 80 years after the Black Death, only 10 households remained. making our way uh, eastwards following an old drove track called the Ox Drove Way, about 25 mile uh, droving route I believe. Seems longer than four and a half miles this walk I think because I keep stopping and admiring these wonderful views. So this is looking south and everywhere both sides it's it's beautiful, so much greenery. It's, um, it's one of the most exquisite parts of the south of England, it really is. The birds twittering away. <laughs> we must kick on. 
We're on our homeward leg of our walk now, heading south back towards the town. And we're right by some commercial watercress beds. So I'll turn around. Hopefully uh, you're not going to get too much uh, glare because it really is quite glorious sunshine now. But uh, watercress has always been grown in wild chalk streams uh, in the area here, but it's always been too perishable to be transported by horse and cart. And it wasn't until the coming of the railways to the town in 1865 that it was commercially viable to transport the crop to London and the Midlands. And basically, cress could be picked in the afternoon and be on sale at Covent Garden the next morning. Now we'll get a closer look in a second of a bed at here in the distance you can see the guys are preparing a bed for the next crop. And then a little bit further down here we've actually got uh, a bed that's full of watercress. I was reading that in 1925 there was a an agreed code of practice that required cress beds to have impermeable sides to prevent entry of contaminated water from the river. So either they had springs or boreholes up to 40 foot down and that basically produces a constant temperature of 10 degrees all year round which means no frost so you often see steam over the beds in winter here. And here we are right at the end of one of the watercress beds. You can see the system we use as clear water that makes its way through from one end through the crest and then out in a gully. And now there is a watercress festival each year in the town usually in May obviously not this year with Covid-19 and there's a cress eating competition and the world record is 85 grams of cress in 32 seconds. <laughs> Well folks, we've come to the end of our walk. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, please give us a thumbs up or like and do make a comment. And if you haven't already done so, uh, please do subscribe and that way hopefully you'll be able to join us for another walk in the countryside sometime in the future. Well, Logan and I are off for a egg and watercrest sandwich now. <laughs> so thanks for watching and until we meet again, cheerio. Ha <laughs> ha.